So this is E six nine eight G lecture eight. So we have been looking at the delay lock loop circuit. Let me quickly refresh your memory. We have this VCDL. We compare the reference edge with the delayed version of the same signal using a phase frequency detector. The outputs from the PFD are given to a charge pump, which pushes and pulls current out of a capacitor so that we get a control node voltage VC developed across this capacitance. And this voltage is used to control the VCDL. So this way we have this negative feedback loop locking the delay of this VCDL to one reference period TREF. Now in the presence of non-idealities, instead of locking to TREF, it may lock to the minimum delay of the VCDL. This is called as false locking or stuck locking. It may lock to the harmonics of the reference period, in which case we say that it is harmonically locked, or it may lock with some static phase offset. So it's an offset, it is static, it doesn't vary from one period to the other, and we use the term phase to differentiate it from any voltage or current offset. It is in phase domain or time domain. And then we started looking. So we saw that uh, if there were any mismatches in the PFD path from input to the up or down paths, then it can result in a static phase offset. If the capacitor had some leakages, this will also cause a static phase offset during the steady state of the DLL. And then we had started looking at the charge pump circuit in detail. So after we learn the charge pump circuit in detail, we'll see how its non-idealities can also cause issues. So the charge pump circuit we had started with was this, with some current I naught. We usually have a capacitor connected at the output and these switches are controlled by up and down. Then we saw that these switches can be replaced with NMOS and PMOS. So the switches got replaced like this. So this had to be up bar, right? Then to interface this with the PFD, now we need an inverter in the path of the up. So let's assume that this PFD was giving us up signal. Then we have to connect an in inverter in the path to generate up bar, whereas the down signal can potentially be connected as it is. So now that there is a delay between the up bar and the down signal, we expect to see the current waveforms slightly staggered with respect to time. They are not on at the same time, due to which some charge is going to get injected into the capacitor, but the same amount of charge will get pulled out. Therefore, we are still at steady state, but our control node voltage will now see ripples. So ideally, after the delay lock loop has reached the steady state, we would like to see this voltage to be steady. It has achieved steady state. We don't want to see any ripples on it because if VC changes, we know that we expect to see some changes in the VCDL behavior. So we'll see what that changes in detail a little later, but it makes sense, right? If VC changes, the VCDL delay is going to be disturbed. It is still, it is still going to have the delay of TREF from the uh, input to the output, but you can expect to see some variation, okay? So ideally, we would like this node to be very quiet in the steady state. So then we said that if we have to match the up bar and the down paths, I could make some modifications in this. So a critical point to remember here is that we are actually not interested in making these two points occur at the same time. We are interested in making sure that these currents occur at the same time. Okay, so that's the minor nuance we have to keep in mind. So this should explain why using a transmission gate might not after all be a good idea. So this was actually a very good suggestion that was given in the last class. I could have the down signal here, connected through an inverter, I will have the down bar signal. Then I can replace both the switches with transmission gates. Now, if I do this, 
I'm guaranteed to have same delay till this point, right? And it looks like this should also offer same delay when the current is in terms of the current waveforms as well. Okay, but let me give you an example. Let's assume that VC is close to zero. Okay, it is some voltage, but much lesser than VDD by two and closer to zero. Now, what determines VC in the loop? The current flowing into it. Okay, so what I had meant was what determines the steady state value. So basically that is determined by the feedback loop. So VC will be whatever the magic voltage required to give reference delay across the VCDL, right? So this VC can vary around the range uh, as our PVT varies. But for now, let's assume that VC is closer to zero. If VC is closer to zero, let's look at this transmission gate. This has an NMOS and a PMOS. The PMOS in this transmission gate is not going to function because it cannot conduct zero very effectively. Whereas the NMOS here is on. What about this transmission gate? Both PMOS and NMOS are conducting, right? So you can clearly see that the resistance offered, effective resistance in the down path is going to be higher than the effective resistance in the up path. Similarly, if I consider a VC much, much closer to VDD, the opposite will happen. So as such, the circuit alone do not guarantee that the up and the down currents will occur at the same time. Okay. Now, it is possible that maybe for a particular implementation of this entire loop, your VC value is expected to vary for a small range around VDD by two. So in such cases, maybe there is still utility for a circuit like this. Okay. So these are implementation details and some of them will become clear only when you actually design the circuit. Okay, so now we have, we are still constructing our charge pump. So we have some I naught and I naught. We know what to do with the switches now. We will simply have to replace it with transistors. Any comments on how we can generate I naught? So anytime we design a circuit, we take few things for granted, right? We assume that we have a supply, we have some ground, and if the circuit requires a clock, we usually assume that there is a clock also available. So similarly, another reasonable assumption to make is that you have at least one reference current available to you, right? So if a reference voltage other than VDD is required, you can generate it based on VDD. So similarly, once you have a single reference current, all the other current requirements within the circuit has to be met by mirroring this current, by mirroring and multiplying it as required. Now, in practice, suppose this is your complete chip, the chip might be given a single reference current, or you might be generating this reference current internally using a band gap circuit. We'll not worry about that now, but for now, we will assume that we have one reference current available to us. Okay, so if you have a single reference current, I can pass this through an NMOS, which is connected as shown here. So as this reference current is flowing through the NMOS, we will have some VGS developed across this. Now, if I connect the same VGS to another NMOS here, so this also sees the same VGS, this has to mean that the current through this is also IRF. Okay, let's assume that channel length modulation is zero. This is fine. Okay. So now let me name the transistors. This is M1, M2, M3. We'll use M4 for this uh, implementation. And let's say this is M5. So if this has a width of W by L5, and I give this a size of N times W L5, what is the current flowing through this? N times I right? So this way I can multiply the IRF to a required value such that I get some I naught here, okay? 
So now I have to replace this with a transistor. Tell me what to do. Okay, so I take a PMOS. I connect it in this diode connected fashion. Now, if I ensure that some IRF is flowing through this, then I will have a VSG developed here. And I connect the same VSG to another PMOS here. Right? And if I scale this correspondingly, so if this is M4 and this is M6, so if I make sure that M4 is sized n times M6, I will have n times IRF flowing through. But we can't assume another ideal reference current. We can assume only one, but we can get IRF to flow through this simply by connecting an NMOS here. This is clear? Okay, so now I have a circuit. I have the complete charge from circuit and I have this I naught current flowing through both the parts. Any questions? Now, if channel length modulation was present, what issues do you see? So what is the equation for the current? In what region are all these transistors expected to be other than the switches? They are expected to be in saturation region. So tell me the equation for the current. Uh, assume long channel transistors. VGS minus VTH whole square into one plus lambda VDS. Okay, so this is if lambda was equal to zero and the current was only a function of VGS minus VTH, then we are set, we don't have a problem. Now, if lambda is non-zero, that means the current now also depends on the drain to source voltage. So this voltage here is VC. This is set by the negative feedback loop, right? Now, if this is VC, this is a switch. When it is on, we will have some drop across it, right? So this is a switch in linear region. When current flows through this, there will be some VDS drop across it. Therefore, the voltage here will be equal to VC minus V drop. Now the voltage seen by M5 is simply VGS. VGS required for IRF to flow through it. There is no reason why this VGS and VC drop have to be equal. Okay. That means we are going to make errors when we mirror the current here. We will make another error when we mirror current here and some error in mirroring the current here. So what this means is that we cannot assume both the currents to be equal. So we are going to call them as I up, this is the current in the up path and I down. And I up need not be equal to I down. Is this clear? Okay. So now let's see what happens to the DLL steady state if I up and I down are not equal, okay? So as before, Let's assume that it is locked correctly. And I'm looking at the one period after it has locked. Okay, so you can assume that I up is greater than I down. And let's say I up is equal to some I naught plus delta I and I down is some I naught. So I up is greater than I naught. Sorry, I up is greater than I down. So you can plot up, down. Then the current waveforms I up, I down, and finally I C and V C. So can you sketch this and see if our DLL will be in steady state, uh, under steady state, whether it will if this particular situation is really steady state. If it is not, see if you can back calculate 
what would be the steady state lock condition? So let me quickly sketch out the waveforms. So I up, sorry, up and down are going high at the same time and they will be on for a period of T reset. I up is on for a duration of T reset, but with the value I naught plus delta I. Similarly, I down is also on for the duration of T reset, but it has a lower magnitude. This is only I naught. So if I were to look at the IC, I will see that it is on for the duration of T reset with a value delta I. So some amount of charge is being pushed into the capacitor. Therefore, VC value is also going to change. So this is clearly not the steady state, right? So to make this into steady state, what should I do? I have to somehow cancel or inject opposite charges Equal, equaling this area, right? So there are two ways in which I can do it. Either I have to change the height of I up and I down, but let's say the charge pump currents are fixed. Then I have to change the pulse width of up and down. So I could either reduce the pulse of I up because that is the larger current, or I can increase the pulse width of down, okay? Now this I up, is already on for the minimum possible time, T reset. I cannot reduce it further. So the only option is to increase the down pulse rate. Okay. So down has to be on for a longer time, which means I need to get a curve like this, which means out has to lead the referencing. Now, if this happens, my IC waveform will be like this. And this area and this area will cancel out. How will my VC look like? So initially it will reduce with a larger slope. And then during this T reset time, it will slowly come back to the original. This is clear. Okay, so let me give you a question here. Calculate peak to peak ripple in VC. You can do this as a homework for the above figure. Okay, so tell me, so here we need to lock with the offset. How do we calculate the value of this offset? So we equate the areas. So it is T reset into delta I will be equal to I naught into TOS. Yeah. Therefore, my offset is equal to delta I by I naught into T reset. Now, let's see if this makes sense. If delta I increases, offset increases. Makes sense, right? If delta I is zero, we wouldn't have this offset in the first place. If I naught increases, offset will decrease because if the value of I naught is larger, I need lesser pulse width to cancel out the same amount of charge. Now, if T reset increases, the offset increases. So shouldn't this mean that if I reduce the T reset to zero, I won't have an offset? So should we pay extra attention in making this T reset smaller and smaller? Or is there a bottleneck somewhere? First of all, this makes sense, right? It is proportional to T reset because that is the duration for which we have the mismatched current flowing into the capacitor.
Huh. So, but I can make it as close to zero as possible, meaning I can make it smaller and smaller. Is that an acceptable solution or is something going wrong if I do that? So let's look at it. Let's see what comment we can make about the time taken for the current sources to switch on. Okay, so this is M1, this is M3. Let me consider this node as N1. And you can think of a parasitic capacitance associated with this node. This is basically the CGD of M3, CGS of M1, and any routing parasitics at this node, right? So now in this scenario, Let's say I have a down signal that is going like this. We will analyze only the down path for now. So let's say at instance T1, so at T1, what is the voltage at N1? Is this switch on or off? At T1, this is off, right? What about M3? M3 is on because it has some bias voltage here. So let me represent this bias, bias voltage as VBN, V bias for the N MOS, and we will call this as V bias for the P MOS. Okay. It has a bias voltage which is expected to be greater than VTH. So this is on. Right. So what is the current flowing through M3? Yeah. Current will be zero, which means N1 will be equal to. Zero. So initially, at the moment when M1 is turning off, this is still pulling out current from this node, right? Which means the voltage at this node is going to keep reducing. And once it hits zero, the voltage at VN1 becomes zero. VDS of M3 is zero. Therefore, no current will flow through. So M3 is in linear region. What about the instant T2? This is much, much away from the edge. Vn1 will be, if there is some Vc voltage here, this will be equal to Vc minus V drop, right? And our M3 is expected to be in, if this is acting as a current source, where do we want M3 to be? So it will be in saturation region. So basically, when you have a rising edge in down, it initially takes some time for this transistor to M1 to turn on. Then it has to charge this voltage such that M3 becomes, M3 enters the saturation region. So it takes some finite time for this current, current flowing through, current getting pulled out of the capacitor to reach the expected value of I down, right? Now with this information, let us analyze the steady state. So let's say I had a reference edge and I had the out edge. Let's say these edges are separated only by a small phase offset. And I'm going to assume very small T reset, which means my up is now going to go high here. Down is going high here. And both of them are going to come down with a very small T reset, right? And I will have some IC, which charges to I0 slowly and then falls down, falls down also quite slowly. This is okay. Now let's say the phase offset has reduced. The phase difference between them, let's say this has reduced, which means now my signals are going to look like this. So let me draw it a little bit more drastically. Now 
Now, under these situations, IC may not have enough time to rise to its intended value. So it may start to rise and then up and down has come down already. So it will fall back. Okay. Now, if this phase difference reduces even further, it's possible to get a situation like this. The IC barely turns on, by then it has to turn off. Okay. Which means for smaller phase difference between reference and out, now our PFT plus charge pump is not responding to the smaller phase differences. So earlier for the PFD, we saw a characteristic curve like this. So we had phase error on the x-axis and we were looking at VPD average and the curve was like this, right? So this went from VDD to minus VDD for a range of 2 pi to minus 2 pi, correct? So now if you see, we are taking the average in terms of IC. We are looking at the average of IC. So I'm going to replace this with average of IC. So instead of VDD, I'll simply put I0. So for this discussion, we are assuming that up and down currents are equal. Okay. Now, instead of getting this curve, for smaller offsets, for smaller phase differences, our PFD plus charge firm is not able to respond. So we'll get a flat region here. And then we'll have the curve like this. Okay. Now let's say we started with the lock point with some phase difference somewhere here. Okay. So earlier we would have been in this curve and then we would slowly move and lock to zero. Right now we are here. We will slowly move in this direction. But once we hit this point, our loop is not able to respond. Right. It, therefore, we will not move towards zero. So we will get stuck at this region. And this is some phi offset. And this corresponds to the this will correspond to an offset in time, which you will see if the T reset is very, very small. Is this clear? Okay. So because of this, it's actually quite important to have a reset within the PFD. So what is sometimes done is. So if our PFD was like this, so this was the original PFD circuit we saw. It, we sometimes intentionally add more delays in the circuit so that we can have large enough T reset to ensure that the currents can turn off. This is clear. Yeah. Uh, why do you say it's a current source and it will always be drawing current? VGS is always there. VGS is always there, yeah. So VGS is always there, so it will not have current. Mm -hmm. So let's say VGS, let's say we start with some high value of VN1, right? Now this path is off. So the circuit is this now with some parasitic capacitance. We have some current getting pulled out. So VN1 is going to reduce. Okay. So now what, what is the condition for M3 to be in saturation? Uh, so VN1 should be greater than VBN minus VTN1. Uh, so yeah, VTN3, right? So now as this voltage is reducing, as VN1 is reducing, at some point, this condition will not be satisfied. So this will enter into linear region. And in linear region, what is the current equation? It will be mu and COX W by L. VGS minus VT into VDS minus media square by two, right? So now as so some current is getting pulled out. It has entered into linear region, but current is still flowing through it. So our VN1 is reducing. Eventually, VN1 becomes zero. So VDS is now zero. So the current also is zero. So this is on. It is in linear region, but with VDS equal to zero and current equal to zero. Yeah. 
We can charge and discharge the capacitor. Yeah. So it will flow into, why do you say parasitics? So up and down current uh, will flow into the loop filter, into the capacitor here, the main capacitor of the delay lock. It may be flowing into the parasitic capacitances. Uh, it will flow into the parasitic capacitances till they reach a steady state value. Yeah. And then it doesn't. Correct. Yeah. This is clear. Huh. So because if I have a, uh, that was a discussion we had uh, with this picture. Because initially we first, when you have the edge, first the switch has to turn on. That will take some finite time. After that has turned on, we need a voltage to build up here of the value VBN minus VTN3. This was initially zero. So this voltage has to go from zero to this value. Then our transistor M3 will enter into saturation region and it will act as a current source. Till then it is a linear region, it is in linear region. So it's some resistance. So some current is flowing, but it is not the expected I down value. It is something smaller than that, right? So it takes some finite time to get to that point. And if you, if you have already sized your current transistor to be large, which means the capacitance at this node is going to be large. So it will take even more time for that node to charge to VBN minus VTN. Okay. Okay. So we, we have now realized that T reset is relevant. So we have to have a finite T reset. Now we have to go back into the charge pump circuit and see what we can do to make the up and down current sequence. So any suggestions? So we have to now match. up and down currents. So what we will do is we'll use negative feedback and we are going to make I up track I down. I can do the reverse also. I could set I up and then make I down track I up. Okay, but either way, we are just trying to make sure that both these have the same value. So let us start. So I generate my down current like this. And now I need to generate some VBP here such that it ensures the I down and I up are equal. So this is RA. So this node voltage is VC, right? We are going to use some negative feedback. So first I will make sure that I have this current flowing current available all the time. So right now I have this I up and I down available only when the switches are turning on, right? So I'll have a replica circuit here. So I need to connect this also to VPP. So this is for the up, but I want to make sure that this is always on. So I'll connect this to ground. This I will connect to VDD. So this is the response to the down switch. And this gets connected here, right? Now let me call the current, so let this be I down. I will call this as I up dash, and I will call this as I down directly because the currents, okay, let me call this also as I down dash. So now there is some node voltage here. Vx. What should be the value of Vx such that I down dash and I down are equal?
So we have to make sure that the VGS and the VDS seen by the transistors are same. So let us look at only the down path now, right? So I have to make sure that the VGS seen by, uh, so M1, M2, M3, M4, let's say M6 and M7. So VGS seen by M6 and M3 are same and that the VGS seen by M1 and M7 are the same. Okay, that is ensured for, that is ensured by default, right? Because M6 and M3 are saying the same, same VGS. And M7 and M1 will say the same VGS when down is equal to VDD. Now I have to make sure that the VDS seen are also same. So if I have to make the VDS to be same, what should be the value of VX? It should be equal to VC. Any questions here? Okay, good. So I have to make sure that this VX is, should be equal to VC. Now let's say I did calculation by setting Vx to be equal to Vc and I found out what is the value of Vvp required such that I up will be equal to I up dash. So this is something I can do, right? I fix Vx to be equal to Vc. I do large signal calculations and I find out what is the Vvp required. Now, once I ensure that, what comment can you make about this I up dash and I down dash? Are they different or equal? They are equal because it's the current flowing through the same branch. So I up dash and I, am, I down dash are equal. And if I ensure that Vx equal to Vc and I set this VVP accordingly, this has to mean now that I down dash is equal to I down and I up dash is equal to I up. And since they are equal, I up and I down should also be equal. This much is fine? Okay. So now the problem is, let's say I set my VVP like this, but let's say temperature changed or the chip came out in a different corner, the value of VVP to ensure Vx to be equal to Vc is going to be different, right? So now let's say that my I up dash was greater than I down dash because something about our environmental condition has changed. What comment can you make about Vx? Is my Vx going to increase or decrease? Okay, why? Because I up dash is more, so more current is flowing into the node than the current that is flowing out. So the Vx is going to increase more than Vc. So my Vx is greater than Vc. Or in other words, I can write Vx minus Vc is greater than zero. Now, under this condition, I want to reduce my I up dash. What should I do to VBP? Should I increase VBP or decrease VBP? Increase VBP? Now, if I up dash was smaller than I down dash, what is the observation I can make about Vx? Vx will decrease, which means Vx minus Vc will be less than zero. And what do I have to do? I have to reduce this VBP. So in other words, I want this control voltage source to be a variable source, and it has to make decision based on the difference of Vx minus Vc. So what should I connect here? An amplifier, like very simple. <laughs> so I have to basically connect a voltage controlled voltage source. Or in other words, I can put an amplifier. And what should be the signs of the amplifier? So if Vx minus Vc is greater than zero, the output has to increase. So this is plus and this is minus. So that's it. So I do this and then if uh, I can ensure that I up dash is equal to I down dash. And that will happen when this node is set to VC. And if this node is set to VC, it will mean that I up is equal to I down. 
Okay. Any questions on this? So now let me ask another question. Is it really necessary for I down dash and I down to be the same value? Or can I use a scale down current in this replica path? So let's say I had some current I naught flowing through this. So I up is equal to I naught and I down is equal to I naught. I can size all these transistors such that the current through this is I naught by N. Right? So I can save on power. The replica circuit and the bias circuit is they are always consuming some current. So I scale down the current so that the power consumption in the bias circuit is lower. I naught value can be much larger. Uh, so the current through this can be much larger, but this I naught under steady state is on only for a short duration. Therefore, the power consumption in this branch is anyways closer to, it's very small. Okay, so this is a critical circuit. So maybe you can take a minute to see if you have any questions. So then let's look at the limits on the VC voltage. So I will consider only the main charge pump branch. So this is VBP. Abbar. down and this is VBN. So our VC voltage should be such that these two current transistors, let's say M1 and M4 remain in saturation, right? So let's say this is M3, M2. And let's say when the switches turn on, they have a drop given by V drop in the down path and V drop in the up path. So can you find out what is the maximum and minimum values possible for B VC based on VBP, V drop, VBN, uh, and the corresponding threshold voltage of these transistors? So let us consider the down path first. So if, what is the minimum voltage required here for M1 to be in saturation? So its drain voltage has to be greater than VBN minus VTN, okay? Which means the minimum VC possible here is so the VC has to be lesser than, VC has to be greater than VBN minus VTN plus V drop. Okay. Similarly, for this transistor, its drain voltage can go as high as VBP plus mod VTP, right? If it increases further, M4 will go out of saturation. And then the voltage that will appear here will be this minus the drop. Therefore, VC has to be lesser than VBP plus mod VTP minus the drop in that switch. This is okay. Now, does this mean that if I put everything in a delay locked loop, 
the vc voltage is not going to be you know out of this range so i wrote the title as limits of vc what does that mean for us does it mean that if i put within a delay lock loop it doesn't go within so let me call this as some vc minimum and vc maximum right so if i were looking at the vcdl characteristic so if I had some TP versus VC and I had some curve like this, earlier we were expecting to operate between zero to VDD, but now we are limited between some VC minimum and VC maximum. So now the question is this, if I were to put this in a delay lock loop circuit, does it mean that my VC will be limited to this or does it mean something else? So, uh, transistor will go out of okay so okay so can you so does it mean that vc is still within the range or is it possible for me to be operating somewhere here your answers are correct but there is more to it. three or four more sentences maybe <laughs> So it's possible for your VC to come out of this range. All that this means is that if my VC goes below, let's say VC min, M1 will come out of saturation. So it is acting like a resistor, but it can still pull out the current out of the capacitor, right? So it is possible for it to go into these ranges. So why this is relevant is, let's say I had multiple curves, right? And you are worried about uh, false locking and harmonic locking, etc. You have to think about this considering the whole possible range for VC. But you also want to make sure that your locking point, TRF, happens within this range. Because within this range, we know what the value of I0 is, we know all the circuit parameters. So we can, loosely speaking, talk about the gain of the feedback path because all parameter values are clearly known. But if you exceed this range, then I have no control over I0. So I can't make much comments about the gain of the feedback path. So we would like to make sure that the steady state point we expect is such that it, it is within this VC range. That's all. Okay. Now let us look at a uh, few more non-idealities within the charge pump. So this is called as clock feed through. So let me consider only the down path. So I have a CL. So this is basically the capacitance on which VC voltage is developing. So this is a down signal. <coughs> and this is some VBN. So when I have a rising edge in down signal, we are going from zero to VDD. It is possible for this signal to affect the voltage VC through a capacitance. So this is CGD. So if this is M1 and M2, this is basically CGD2. So at the instance when the down signal is going high, at, the, at that instance, let's assume that the transistors are yet to turn on, right? So at that exact instance, the signal will couple to the output through CGD2. Okay, so you can expect to see a jump on the voltage VC. Can you comment on what that jump would be? You can assume that the transistors have not started responding yet. So this circuit is basically now equivalent to having a circuit like this. So this is CGD2 and this is CL. Okay, so when you have a connection like this, at the instance where you have a sharp transition, you will have impulse currents flowing through it. And if you solve, you will get that this is equal to VDD into CGD2 divided by CL plus CGD2. 
Okay. Any any questions on this? Okay. So this is again an unnecessary disturbance on to the uh, VC voltage simply because the clock is now feeding through the capacitance, hence the term clock feed through, right? So any suggestions on what can be done? So the problem is happening because we have now a switching circuit connected to the node that we don't want to be disturbed. Disconnect. So I have a switch here. How is that? So I will have a switch here. Then I will have a switching a signal to control that switch. How is that different? Yeah. Yeah. What if I swap the position of the current source and the switch? So anytime you want a node to be quiet, we generally try to avoid anything switching around that node and we remove the switching circuitry away from it. So this is a general technique used. So possible solution here is to swap these two, have the current source closer to the, uh, closer to this VC and the switch away from it. Okay, but we'll deal with it in a minute. We'll deal with that solution in a minute. I also want to show you what happens if I consider both the up bar and down signal at the same time. So let's say, so this is my down and I have up bar. I have a falling edge, I have a rising edge, and I have both capacitances, let's say CGD. So this is M1, M2, M3, and M4. So this is CGD2, and I have CGD3, and then a capacitance here. Okay, so we can use superposition and then calculate the jump in uh, VC at the instant when both down and up are going high. We'll assume that they are occurring at the same instance for now. So this delta V would be equal to VDD into, I'm calculating the voltage here, CGD2 divided by the total capacitance at that node, which is CL plus CGD2 plus CGD3, right? So here it is going from VDD to zero. So basically the difference is minus VDD. So I can write it as minus VDD into CGD3 by the same capacitance. So I will take VDD outside and I'll have the expression like this. Okay. So does this mean that if I have both up bar and down, I don't have to worry about uh, the clock feed through because it looks like I have a subtraction here. So there is no reason for us to actually make up and down the M3 and M2 transistors to be of the same size, right? One, both are, one is NMOS, one is PMOS. They will have different effective resistances. So I'm more likely to make my PMOS to be larger so that the drop seen across it is smaller. Plus they are two different devices. So there is no reason for CGD2 and CGD3 to be equal. So even when you have a circuit like this, you would still see a jump on VC. So this jump might be slightly smaller than the one that we saw earlier, but you would still see a jump. And so one good solution, like I said, is to move the switches away from this node. But another thing would be to simply make sure that your CL is much larger. Your CL is much larger, the jumps getting coupled here will be small. Okay. Okay. So there is one more reason why we will want to keep the switches away from VC, and that is called as charge injection. So if I have a MOSFET, either NMOS or PMOS, this is gate, drain, and source, anytime this uh, transistor is turning on, we have a channel that is getting formed between the drain and the source, which means there are channel charges available. So now when I turn this off, this channel charge has to go somewhere and it will come out through the drain and the source. 
and how much comes out on the drain side and how much comes out on the source side will depend upon the impedance seen on both the sides, right? So now in our circuit, whenever we turn on or turn off any of these switches, some amount of charge is going to get pulled out of this capacitor, okay? And this is called as charge injection. Now, if I remove these, if I place these switches closer to the supply rails, then what it means is that, so let's say I put the switch closer to the supply rail, right? So now what it means is that it will see very less impedance on the source side. So all of this channel charge is going to go into the source and not onto the capacitor, okay? So instead of looking at a charge from topology where we had this current source first and the switch second, now we are going to swap them and we will have the switch first and then the current source. Okay, so this was the original structure we saw. Now this is actually called as drain switched charge pump. Because we had the switches connected to the drain of the current sources, okay? So this was the PMOS, this was the NMOS. So switches were connected to the drain of the current sources. Therefore, this is called as a drain switched charge pump. What should I call this? So this is called as source switched charge pump. I mean, the moment you see these two, you should naturally have the question. I have drain switched, I have source switched. So shouldn't I have a gate switched charge pump as well? So that is also there. But first, <laughs> first let us see how to bias the source switched charge pump. So why don't you go and implement the source switched charge pump? Assume that channel modulation, uh, channel length modulation is zero. So without using any negative feedback, uh, please implement this at transistor level. Assume a single reference current IR. So we want some VBP here. No, sorry, we want the... So this is up bar. This is VBP. Then VBN. This is my down signal. And this is where I connect the capacitor. So we have one reference current. So let's say I do a diode connected NMOS, I get some VGS here. Now, if I directly connect this and I connect this to ground, the VGS of this and VGS of VGS seen by this will not be the same. So what I can do is I can replicate the circuit here, mirror the same functionality as before and make sure that this is always on. Because when I need the current to flow through this, down signal is going to be VDD. Okay, so then now I need to do the same thing for the up path. So I will have a PMOS, which is always on corresponding to this transistor. And then I use the diode connection to generate VPP. Now I need to get this IRF flowing through this. So I will connect it here. Again, I will need to have an always on switch here to make sure that the VG is seen by this transistor is free. <coughs> okay. So next part is, so I'll give this as homework. 
assume lambda is now not equal to zero, how will you implement negative feedback in the circuit to make I up equal to I down? So this you can do as a homework. So we can end the class here.